Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 273, recorded Monday, November 14th, 2016. The Tetris Effect. Triangulation is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to Audible.com slash Triangulation. And by the all-new Basecamp 3. Discover a much calmer, more organized way to work with your team. Try it out for free at Basecamp.com slash Twit. And by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access, starting at just $2.99 a month, or for our audience, the first two months, completely free, if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash twit and use the offer code twit. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and talk about, you know, their stuff. We get brighter as we talk and listen. We call it triangulation because usually there's three legs to this stool. That's not a really good motto, is it? <laughs> there's three sides to this triangle. There's me, there's our guest, and there's you. If you can join us live as we do the show in the chat room at irc.twit.tv, uh, we welcome you and your questions and thoughts and suggestions. And I think on this one, it's going to be very uh, valuable or more than welcome. Our guest is Dan Ackerman. He is a journalist who's written a book that's very... Hey, Dan, welcome. Uh, great to be here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, a timely, timely book because, uh, well, we're all going through this nostalgia phase right now. You saw the NES Classic is selling oh, yeah. so fast nobody could keep it in stock. And uh, Dan has just released a book called The Tetris Effect, which I would hold up right now. Fortunately, Dan can do the holding for me. But it's on my bedside table. <laughs> Ooh, it's, nice. Yes. And I forgot to bring it in uh, today. The definitive story of a game so great, even the Cold War couldn't stop it. And before the show, as uh, Dan and I were talking, I was mentioning that we've talked, uh, I've talked twice to Alexei Bajitnov, the creator of Tet Tetris. Once when he first uh, kind of emerged in the scene, I think he was still in the Soviet Union at the time, and then more mm -hmm. recently, not so long ago. Uh, and he's the sweetest guy. Does Tetris begin with Alexei Pajitnov? It does. It's 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 the the reason why I thought the story was so interesting. It was sort of a, a one man startup story, the kind that we talk about all the time now. But it was a startup story that started in the Cold War Soviet Union back in the eighties. So that makes it even more you know amazing that it's something we're still talking about today. And Alexei Pajitnov was a mathematician in Russia. He became a computer programmer. Worked at the Russian Academy of Science. And they had access to, you know, computers that were knockoffs of American computers that were, you know, 10 or 15 years out of date. Uh, but he had this love for puzzles as, as, as a kid and as a teenager. And he wanted to, besides the research he was doing, try to recreate some of those puzzles, especially pentominoes, which is where you take these five uh, segment pieces and you fit them into a box. That's like an old fashioned game. You make them out of wood or cardboard or plastic. And he wanted to see if his Electronica 60 computer uh, which didn't have any graphics capabilities, was just text on a screen, could create something like that. So he basically made the blocks out of brackets and just played around with it for a while until he got it right. Yeah. It does remind me a lot of Pentominoes because um, it, it's the same skill in your brain of arranging geometric shapes to interlock, and the better you do it. The difference, Pentominoes, you get all the time in the world. <laughs> in Tetris... There's even the soundtrack. and I, Well, tell me about the early Tetris. We just showed a, a clip of it. It was using the ASCII symbols, the glyphs, in the code, in the uh, ASCII code to draw on the screen. Sure, and you remember um, Alexei and his comrades at the uh, Russian Academy of Science, they were actually pretty advanced for computer programmers in the day. He was working on things like artificial intelligence, speech recognition, things that we're still kind of struggling with now. So he was like, pretty much on the cutting edge. Uh, but even then, to create something that was like a real-time game on this computer equipment back then, uh, that was a challenge. Uh, so you're right, he used the, he used the uh, symbols on the keys, originally with brackets. Uh, later, he worked with uh, another guy to, to, to make a version that would work on DOS computers, on basically IBM-compatible computers, which were just starting to filter into the Soviet 
Soviet Union. And that was super important because unless you had the exact same computer he had, you couldn't play this game Tetris. Once they got the DOS version going, uh, they started making copies of the disc and passing it around to their friends. And it sort of became a viral hit in a pre-internet way when you had to literally sneaker net it over to other people and go, oh, here's a copy on a floppy disk. I'm going to make you a copy and hand it off to you. And that sort of became a black market hit in Moscow. Did it emerge a full, full formed or was it an evolving game? I, it, it's still evolving today. You know, yeah. the original version, as you think of, uh, you know, it's just uh, monochromatic. There was no music. There was no score. Uh, there was no decoration. Uh, later in Russia, still, they managed to add some of those elements like the score and some of the colors once they moved to the DOS platform. But it really wasn't until Western companies Electronic got their claws arts. into oh, it. Oh, God, they uh, ruined it. They, yeah, yeah. And even before then, they were Mirasoft and Spectrum Holobyte and oh, those yeah, guys. Oh, Spectrum Holobyte. Oh, my oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's really where they said, you know what? We've got this uh, game from some Russian guys. Why don't we sell it? as something that's kind of forbidden and secret and from behind the Iron Curtain. I remember and you're not, they had onion, yeah, you they had onion domes of the Kremlin yeah. in the background, and they had Russian, you know, kind of music. The plinky and, folk music <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the art. All that was completely the creation of the guys at Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte, which were sister companies back then, both owned right. by uh, Robert Maxwell, the English media baron who used to own the, right. you know, a bunch of newspapers here in the U.S. and in the U.K. Right. Uh, you know, so they they dressed it up in that in that fashion and put it in a red box. The Russians knew it was a Russian game. Uh, they didn't need a red box to tell them that. That was for us. <laughs> so um, let's. Uh, I want to go back. So let's set the stage for uh, Tetris. That's the. There you go. There's the. Uh, we're showing the Spectrum Holobyte mm -hmm. version of uh, Tetris with its primitive PC graphics. But let's. I want to kind of set the stage. So this was the. Was it the? Uh, what year was it? Early '80s. Yeah, like 1984 is really when so Alexei was, got the final version of Tetris together in that you know initial form. What was this? What was the gaming world like at the time? I'm trying to remember. What were we doing? I mean, the uh, I think the NES came out in '85. It's just before the NES, and it's also very importantly just before Gorbachev. So you're right at the cusp of these two things. If it was just a couple of years later, um, Alexei and his friends at the Russian Academy of Science, they had some ideas about, you know, maybe we could put together some programs and yeah. sell them, but yeah. they didn't know how to do it. They didn't have any entrepreneurial role models. There was, uh, it, was, it, was a, a, it was communist. They didn't, yeah. yeah. In fact, I'm surprised that the Russian government didn't take it. Oh, oh, but they, no, well, first they didn't know what was going on. And then when they found out what was going on, they certainly did. They got involved. Uh, that's yeah. what I thought, this, that, that's what I found so fascinating about the story. It's a game story. It's a technology story, but it's also like a business story about this like kind of startup culture in Russia that doesn't really, really exist. And how these frankly semi unscrupulous Western businessmen came in and said, oh, don't worry, we'll, <laughs> we'll take care of you. And then everyone's wondering where the checks went and the, right. and the Soviets finally go, wait a minute. Somebody's selling something that came from Russia. Well, we own everything in Russia because of communism. Where's our money? And that's sort of a big part of the narrative thriller-like thrust of the book uh, is the Ru the Russians putting together this economic hit squad to get the money back from these Western companies. What was the first Tetris version written in? Uh, that was written uh, in, in, in whatever, I forget, whatever primitive language they used on the Electronic at 60, which was it, Alexei Pajanov's personal computer, which was a knockoff of like an NEC computer from like the late 70s. Was it running DOS? No. That was the first sort of revision. He got a young, a high school kid who was basically hanging out at the Russian computer center because uh, he wanted to get his hands on, on computer time and it was very hard to do. He, this kid, uh, who now works for Google in Australia, oh, wow. um, created that DOS version and that's really where it started to to filter out so first it went from you know the the 10 people they knew with computers to the couple of thousand people in moscow with computers at the time not a very large number to other cities then eventually someone sent a copy to hungary to a school there and hungary was still behind the iron curtain but it was sort of the gateway to the west it was a little more liberalized even back then uh, ideas could sneak out through hungary much like the other big 80s puzzle that came from there rubik's cube which was hungarian Interesting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, let's take a break. And, uh, and I want to talk about uh, what happened as it started uh, to emerge in the first Western uh, version. And of course, the response of the Soviet Union to the success of it. Uh, you, you are also going to, in a, in a, when we come back, settle a score because Ooh. I have, I remember in my first interview with Alexei, he told me what he got paid, and I asked him uh, in our most recent interview, and he denied it. So I'm going to ask you, because you will know the truth Ooh, I might. of how much he made 
on uh, Tetris. But first, I want to talk about a place you can listen to this book, audible.com. Of course, our great sponsor. We've been very uh, fond of Audible on this network because they, they kind of really got us started and continue to support the network. And I've been an Audible member long before I started when uh, in uh, the year 2000. I've been a member of Aud at Audible since uh, for 16 years, which means I have hundreds of books. And that's one thing I like about Audible. Uh, when I first started listening to audiobooks, they came in boxes of cassettes. And you had a month to listen, even if it was like 20 cassettes. You had a month to listen. And then you had to send it back. That book was gone. With Audible, it was such a change. First of all, I could download the book. So I had it almost instantly, even in those days. Nowadays, you really do have it instantly. And furthermore... I didn't have to send it back. So in the 16 years I've been an Audible member, I have hundreds, I think almost 500 books in what I consider my audio library. And I can listen anywhere on my computer. Uh, it even works in a browser now. Audible allows you to stream directly from your uh, browser. So if you have a Chromebook, of course you can listen to Audible. Of course on your mobile device, uh, on your tablet, uh, on your Amazon Echo. I li that's actually become my preferred way to listen now. When I'm working out in the gym or cooking dinner, uh, playing with the dog, just sitting outside, I will say, uh, I don't, I'll say, Echo, listen to my book. I don't even have to tell it. It knows what la the book is I've been reading and the last page I was on, and it continues where I left off. I love this. And Audible's readers are great. They are often actors from Broadway, because Audible's uh, in the New York area, and uh, they, they come in and they record these great books. Audible's been uh, doing this great project to re-record or in many cases, for the first time, record audiobooks of the great science fiction classics. And so they really bring these, these to life. And with new books like The Tetris Effect, uh, Dan Ackerman d reads it himself. And Dan is obviously, you know, his DJ background comes through and brings that book to life. So that could be your first book. I'm going to get you a book free right now if you go to Audible dot com slash triangulation you'll be signing up for the gold account that's the book a month account you also get the daily digest of the wall street journal or the new york times your pick so you get to listen to news and then listen to your book and if you cancel any time in the first 30 days you'll owe them nothing but the book as always with audible is yours to keep forever so pick a book this would be a good one and 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 if you've never listened to an audio book try it out for me i was stuck in the car with a commute from hell so it wasn't a question, oh, am I going to like this? It was like, please, I want to stop listening to, to the radio. Give me something, anything. And Audible was a lifesaver. But you, we get a lot of choices now to listen to. Maybe you're wondering, is it a good way to listen to a book? I love it. Give it a try. I feel like it's a movie in your mind. Audible.com slash triangulation. Your first book awaits. And this would be a great one. The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. Dan Ackerman is our guest. He is a senior editor at uh, CNET. He's written about gaming and talked about gaming, even uh, been on TV about gaming for years. And this is, uh, you've written fiction before. I didn't realize that. So this is his first nonfiction uh, book. Great to have you on the show today. Dan. So super fun to be here. Let me tell you, I, I, I did, when I did the audio book, I, I thought, oh, that'd be easy. I'll just go in and read oh. it. They put me like a week of studio time. I'm like, am yeah. I really going to need a nine to five, five days in a row? Uh, Hachette, the, the publisher, just said, yeah, come in and do the book kind of last minute. Uh, I took that as a vote of confidence. They wanted the audio book right away. Sometimes the audio book comes later for these. So I just went in and let me tell you, after the first day, I almost passed out. It's grueling. It's a strenuous, grueling thing. Yeah. I have such respect. For people who do audiobooks now, it, it's such a huge production. So much care goes into it. Yeah. I, I really, really changed what I thought about audiobooks completely. Yeah. And yet when you listen now, it's a way of directly communicating with your reader and being, you know, kind of in, in the book. I think after you write a book, you just, you kind of lose track of it. It just goes out there and, and the people are reading it. This way, you're really talking to the reader, which I think is kind of interesting. You um, can hear me mangle a lot of Russian names. <laughs> that must have been fun, huh? <laughs> so Alexei... Pajitnov. Pajitnov. I've been saying it wrong all this time. Maybe that's why he lied to me. So ah. the first time I interviewed him, he told me, I said, well, did you make anything for this? And I think he was still in Soviet Union when he said this, or still in Russia, because it was, I think it was the 80s. Uh, he said, no, all I got was PC. He got a 286 PC. Mm -hmm. On my most recent interview with him, he said, no, no, I got more. But I, I think that's what he got, right? You tell me. Well, it's it's what did he get originally? He was really he happy to have a two eighty six, as I remember. Well, back then, that was uh, gold. People <laughs> wait in line for for yeah. bread and, and PCs in in Russia. Yeah, 
Uh, originally, he got nothing because the, the the Soviets came in and they said, well, we own all this. So if a Western businessman wants to come in and negotiate for some rights, well, they're going to talk to us. And they had um, an organization that eventually took over the software licensing called Electro Magorshka. Uh, I'm probably that name, too. But the, the abbreviation was ELORG, which sounds like an evil James Bond organization and, and sort of Jeez, acted the same way as this big overlord group that everyone had to, like, find and negotiate with the big bear-like Russian guy. His name was Nikolai Belikov. And you had to get through him if you wanted, like, arcade rights for Tetris or renegotiated PC rights. And all these Western companies had been buying and selling and swapping and trading rights uh, but the Russians never recognized the legitimacy of that first deal to do that. So uh, according to the Soviet Union, everyone who was buying and selling Tetris was doing it under false pretenses and owed them a lot of money. So so how did it leak out? You said through Hungary. And then when did Spectrum Holobyte get a hold of it? So there was a, um, a Hungarian native who who was a UK naturalized citizen uh, named Robert uh, Stein, uh, and he went to uh, the Eastern Bloc countries occasionally to find basically cheap software uh, that was being made behind the Iron Curtain that he could export to the West and resell at a slight profit. Perfectly reasonable business model. Um, he saw he saw Tetris somewhere and said, "Hey, this sounds pretty interesting. I, I should try to get this." And the Hungarians told him, "Well, it's actually not ours. It belongs to this Russian research group and this guy." So he said, all right, I'm going to throw, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to get in touch with these guys and see what they say. So he sent them a telex, which is like a primitive version of a fax. Uh, it's, it's a very Cold War-esque version of a fax machine, a telex machine. Uh, and just said, hey, I'm interested in uh, licensing your game. Uh, but, you know, that message kind of went into a black hole back in, back in Moscow. They had to find it. They had to translate it, give it to the right guy. Uh, Alexei Pajitov eventually got it. Uh, then he had to get tons of permissions to get a reply translated and then resent. The whole thing took months. And he said, yeah, I'm interested in in in, in this deal. Uh, to the Russians, that was just saying, thanks for the interest and maybe we'll negotiate with you. To Robert Stein, that meant you're, you're agreeing to the deal kind of as I outlined and that's it. I'm your licensor now and I'm going to go out and sell this game. So there was a little bit of a Cold War miscommunication there, depending on who you want to believe. Uh, and he, of course, turned around and sold it to Mirosoft and Spectrum Holobyte, who then relicensed it to you know Sega and Atari and all these other companies. So to be fair to them, Spectrum Holobyte and Mirosoft, they thought they were buying the rights legitimately. Yeah, they all had the idea that this came from this in-between guy, this go-between who worked uh, with, with Eastern Bloc company, companies, you know, frequently. So they, we're not going to ask any questions. He's telling us he's got the rights. We're just going to believe him. Maybe we're not going to dig too deeply into it. But they felt at least reasonably confident legally that they were in, in the right, although that turned out to not be quite as cut and dried as they thought. How much money did Tetris end up making uh, Spectrum Holobyte and Mirosoft in the early days, and how much of that got to so the Soviet Union, and how much of that got to Alexei Pajitnov? You know, at the beginning, it was a cult hit. Uh, people would see it at CES back in the uh, 80s. I know, I remember. Uh, yeah, or Comdex. And, and it was in, the, in those days. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And uh, 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 a guy named Hank Rogers, who's one of the main characters Hank, in the book, saw yeah. it there, yeah. uh, and he wanted to license it for the Japanese market where he worked uh, and also for Nintendo consoles, which were just starting to be really big. Before that, it was on PC. Cult Hit did make a ton of money, but it was okay. Uh, but the Russians didn't see any of that. They kept turning around and going, where's the money? Where's our, where, <laughs> where's our checks? And then when Nintendo came into the picture, uh, that was the promise of some really big money. So the Russians were very paranoid about whether anything would get back to them. Of course, at this point, none of it is getting back to Alexei Pajitnov. He's right. just you know, a, a cog in the Soviet wheel. We're going to have to wait for the Soviet Union to collapse in the early 90s before he gets a turn to at least try to get back in the game. Yeah, I mean, that's just the way it was. You know, you didn't uh, you didn't collect royalties for anything. That's the, the, the way the They're system works. They don't know what intellectual property licensing is. Right, right. Um, so it really didn't break out until Nintendo got it. That was sort of the jump between cult hit and real mainstream. Nintendo at the same time was working on a top secret project that eventually came to be called the Game Boy. It was a really revolutionary yeah. idea, almost Apple-like in its enforced minimalism. Yeah. It was less advanced than other handheld gaming systems. It had a black and white screen. It just had like these two buttons and this one D-pad. It ran on AA batteries, which was huge. Uh, and and it, was, it was a real bold attempt to make something that people could just carry around with them and wasn't too complicated, wouldn't be too expensive. 
expensive, but what game do you pack in with it? Because back then you would pack in games. Uh, Nintendo was like, oh, we'll put Mario in there or Zelda or Donkey Kong. And Hank Rogers, who was friends with Minoru Arakawa, who was the guy who founded Nintendo of America and is a very pivotal key person in video game history, um, Hank Rogers went to him and said, listen, if you put Mario in, only boys who are already Nintendo fans are going to buy this device. If you want everyone to buy this device, put in something different. How about this Tetris game I'm, I'm getting the Japanese licensing rights for? Maybe we could do that. Uh, and it's a little bit of a Rashomon style story where everyone claims that was their idea. That's Hank Rogers' version of that story. I Other think I trust Hank. I think Hank was Hank was yeah. kind of brilliant. Uh, fella. Oh, my God. So, so brilliant. And also yeah. such an interesting guy. I, I describe him as being a bit of a software anthropologist in that he was able to go across different cultures and find software and find games that he thought would work in you know this country or that country and import it and, 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 and regionalize it for Japan or wherever he was. Uh, and he had a really good feel for that. And that's how uh, he became a big software you know, magnate in Japan, uh, despite not even speaking Japanese. Tetris, and he was, you know, he had a great insight, which is not immediately obvious. If you watch somebody playing Tetris, it doesn't, you know, it's not graphically that interesting. It doesn't, the, how compelling it is doesn't come out unless you actually play it and probably play it for a little bit till you, then you get hooked, of course. Uh, and he had a great insight, which is that it was the small mobile version of Tetris that was going to be the killer not the desk. Nobody wants to play Tetris. I mean, maybe we do now, but play Tetris at a desktop computer or even a laptop. It's mobile that makes so much sense. Right around this time, I mean, you could buy mobile poker games. You'd see people in the airport on a game playing these or little football games. These were all kind of purpose built, dedicated little game things. So the Game Boy really hit at a perfect time for this. It did, and this was the perfect combination of like kind of the killer app concept, the perfect software with just the right hardware, because Tetris was simple enough. You could put it on this little monochromatic screen with just two buttons to control yeah. it, and it actually worked and actually made sense. Uh, and if it were not for that combination, uh, we may not be talking, you know, we probably wouldn't be talking about Tetris in the same way now. This really kicked it off, and then right after that, they put it on the Nintendo Entertainment System uh, in the U.S. and the Famicom in Japan, which is what it was called there, uh, and that became an even bigger hit uh, in, in the short term and sold, you know, tens and tens of millions of copies. So, oh, interesting. So it did do very well in the Famicom as well. Oh, it was it was huge, and that's really where the big eventually uh, this whole thing culminates in a gigantic court battle between uh, Nintendo and uh, uh, one of the versions of Atari that split off from the original company, um, and it became called Tangan. Uh, and they both wanted to make NES versions of Tetris, and who had the rights to it? That went all the way back to the Russians, back to wow. the original contract, back to what the definition of a computer was, back to all this infighting between Robert Maxwell and that guy. Uh, 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 Robert Stein and Hank Rogers and and Elorg, uh, it, it all it all came to a head in a dramatic courtroom, you know, kind of scene. Where was the court? Was it in the U.S. or was it in? This the... was in the U.S. This wow! Was in the US. And how do you untangle system. this? <laughs> it was it was a huge thing. Well, they had to worry about getting all these Russian expert witnesses out of the Soviet Union to come to the U.S. to testify, and because Robert uh, Maxwell, the U.K. media uh, baron was literally friends with Gorbachev. He called Gorbachev about this. Like they had they had conversations about Tetris, uh, where Maxwell said to Gorbachev, listen, you gotta get these Nintendo guys out of here. Uh, my company is getting screwed in this in this big battle over who owns the rights to Tetris. And Gorbachev said, Don't worry about that. I'll take care of it. And then, you know, history overtook Gorbachev and he never got a chance to to step on the, you know, put a foot on the scale for 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 Robert Maxwell. But the people in charge in the Soviet Union knew that Robert Maxwell and Mirosoft, uh, by extension, were the favorites of Gorbachev and the ruling party. So everyone was afraid they would make it very difficult for these uh, uh, Russians, including Alexei Pashinov, to get out of the country. And you had to sit there and wonder, are they going to show up to court? Are, are they going to be able to get their papers to fly? So at this point, uh, Pashinov knows what's going on. Yeah, they keep him in the loop. If you want to come in and license Tetris, you have to go sit down in the meeting with Elorg. Uh, Pajadov comes in as kind of an advisor and the creator of the game, but he doesn't actually make the call or any of the money right then. So I'm glad he's not completely left out. He's not, but he's still not making any money on this. He's not. And then Hank Rogers goes to Moscow. There's one pivotal week that sort of opens the book. It's like a spy thriller where Hank Rogers, 
uh, Robert Maxwell's son and, and 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 Robert Stein all raced to Moscow during the same week in like 1989, uh, and they're all trying to have this meeting with Elorg and and Maxwell and and Stein have uh, invites. They're they're going to go have actual meetings. Hank Rogers doesn't have a meeting, doesn't know where their office is, has not been invited, sneaks into Moscow on a tourist visa, uh, and basically has to spy his way around Moscow to find where these guys are and then talk his way through the door and then beat out these other two big businessmen in like these one-to-one -one negotiations. Uh, and during that week, he manages to talk his way through the door. He meets Alexei Pashinov, and the two of them become friends right wow. away because they're both software guys they're both game yeah. programmers they realize they're kindred spirits and they start hanging out and they form this partnership this first this professional and personal partnership that continues you know today almost 30 years later yeah this is it, it's what's amazing is here we are playing you know and and it's the cold war it's in encapsulated in this little game i mean this is this is geo international geopolitics including gorbachev um, it's just it's just a, a, kind of an amazing story, and there is at this point enough money in this that all, all sides are highly engaged, right? I mean, this oh yeah, this game and made the, a, the made Soviet billions Union. of dollars ultimately. Uh, eventually, it definitely made over a billion dollars yeah. uh, lifetime. Uh, even more now that EA does the mobile game version, and they've sold something like 500 million copies of that Jeez game. Louise. And it's on every platform that ever comes out. Uh, but back in the late 80s, the Soviet Union was just starting to collapse, and they really needed hard currency. Uh, and that's why they oh. were grasping at, at every bit of money they could possibly find. And that's why this took on uh, you know, very extreme urgency for them. Uh, and even the people doing the, the negotiating on the Russian side, they had to tread very carefully. They started walking on the wrong side of the uh, Communist Party line, and all of a sudden they were being investigated. They were being followed around town. Wow. I mean, this really, uh, it, it was, it was uh, a, uh, a game of its time in ways more than just the fact that we were all obsessed about it. How, why was it so obsessive, do you think? I mean, were you obsessed? You might be a little younger than me. I think you're a lot younger than me. What did? I mean, I know I remember playing it to the point where you'd actually get sore thumbs and you'd, you'd get blisters. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, it's it's a game. Well, first of all, it's so simple. Uh, it, it activates certain pathways in the brain because it has no narrative to it. Right. Uh, it's a purely visual spatial problem. And scientists over the years have independently come to use it for brain research because it has yeah. certain effects on the cognitive process that you can then measure. They would take people and inject them with uh, basically a colored solution and put them in a PET scan machine and, and scan them uh, to see- And see little blocks dropping. <laughs> yes, almost. Uh, I used to dream about it. I'm sure a lot of people used to dream about it. I would, I would wake up from a dream and have been playing Tetris oh, yeah. in my dream. And that is the Tetris effect. It's a recognized medical condition. Uh, and in the course of the book, there's about three breakout chapters I do talking to different scientists about their work with Tetris, whether it's brain efficiency, whether it's the Tetris effect, uh, whether it's uh, using Tetris to block the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder, oh. which it shockingly does in a very inexpensive, easy to do way. And research into that you know, continues today. Because it's, it's somehow soothing? Uh, because it, the way you play it, the fact that the visual spatial part of it uh, operates on the same highways in the brain as you use to write short term memory to long term memory. So when you have a traumatic experience and then you play Tetris shortly after it, uh, it, it interrupts the long term memory writing. So you can still recall events, but you don't have those flashbacks as often, those debilitating flashbacks. And that's what PTSD is. It just flashes right. in front of your eyes like you're there again. It's not recalling the event that's the problem, it's the flashbacks. And something about Tetris uh, occupies basically the same pathways in the brain and short circuits that process from happening. But it has to happen close to the event. That, that you... They've managed to originally, yes, they've managed to stretch out the time frame, you know, more now in subsequent studies. I love it that it, that one of its points of appeal is that it is at, there is no narr you, you nailed it. There's no narrative. They tried to put some narrative in it and try to jazz it up, but fundamentally, the game itself. It's very simple, and it is nonverbal. It's it's a part of your brain that you don't work. It's the it, often it's a spatial geometric thing. Do I was wondering if uh, this was the first video game that women really liked? 
it was definitely one of the first ones that crossed those boundaries. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I said at a couple of points that it, it's the game for moms and mathematicians. Basically, everyone who would never call themselves a gamer played this game back in the 80s and 90s. You would say, oh, did you play video games? No, of course not. You play Tetris? Well, that's different. That's a puzzle. You know, my mother played Tetris. Right. But you would it's never not a call video a game. game. It's one of the few video games where you're not shooting something. That's, you know, that's true, too. And, it, and it's one of the few that, you know, translates just so perfectly across cultural and international boundaries because you don't need to understand anything right. about a particular language or words or, or, or any kind of, you know, cultural cues aside from the fake Russian ones the, you know, the British and the American <laughs> guys put into it that make you go, oh, this, this looks kind of like Cold War, so I'm totally going to play this. Uh, but that's what Hank Rogers did so well. He realized that this would work in any culture. And, and, and it has. It became a worldwide phenomenon because of that. I want to find the Tetris music because I know I actually have PTSD from Tetris. And I know when I hear it, it's all going to come back. Yes, yeah, Koro Beniki, I think it's called. It's a traditional Russian folk tune that they made sort of a, a, an early chip tune version of. Uh, and and you still when you hear that, you just go, oh, yeah, that's the that's the music right Karsten, there. Do you have my audio? Hold on a second because I have it. This is the Game Boy uh, Tetris theme. Was that mm -hmm. the, was that is that when it was first? This is 1989, right? Yes. Okay. And different slight variations in the music over the years. You know, different people use different versions, but there's something about that kind of plinky Russian folk music that immediately makes you go, "Oh yeah, okay, that's Tetris." You know, I'm I'm mad at you, Dan, because now I'm wanting to play Tetris. <laughs> I bet you people read your book and, and that before they could possibly finish it, they're playing Tetris. Uh, the one I found that was uh, really good for not getting too deep, it's called Tetris Blitz, and EA does it for the Love iPhone. Yeah. It, it's 60 seconds, so like you're, yeah. you you have an app. But I, I look at games like uh, Bejeweled, uh, and there, there are a number of games that really follow on this same kind of addictive brain pathway. I feel like there is a brain pathway that it... That, it, that is now furrowed in my mind. Yeah, there you go. Oh, God. <laughs> oh. Oh, that is and, right. Gee. It is. It, so that's a Russian folk song. It's not a that's pseudo a Russian song. Folk song. No, no. Oh, my God. And then later, in like the early 90s, there was a British uh, 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 pseudonymous uh, DJ act uh, called Dr. Spin that had like a top 10 hit with like a dance remix of this. And it turns out uh, it was actually Andrew Lloyd Webber. No. Under his DJ name, Dr. Spin, who did a dance remix of that. <laughs> now that, I want you to find that, Karsten. Let's see if we can play that. And while we do, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Dan Ackerman is our guest. He's a senior editor at CNET, author of a brand new book. What the what? Look at the video of this. Dr. Spin. And they're all wearing, all the people in the video are wearing little Tetris block hats. Oh, this is a little disturbing. Was this a hit? Yeah, this is a, this is a UK card hit. <laughs> and it's Andrew Lloyd Webber. That's right. I know That's why he didn't put his name on it. <laughs> The book is The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. It's available now on the bookstore shelves, of course, at Amazon.com and at Audible.com if you want to listen to Dan read his own book. Seven hours and three minutes of sheer Tetris joy. You know what's great about the audiobook? You can play Tetris while you're listening to it. I, I tell people it's like taking a road trip with me. I'll, I'll come hang out with you for seven <laughs> hours and change. We're, we're just going to go for a ride. It's okay. <laughs> Our show, it's great to have you, Dan. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, God, I just, my fingers are itching. I want to play. Our show today brought to you by Basecamp. You maybe remember our interview with uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen uh, a couple of weeks ago, the creator of Basecamp. Uh, you, uh, we also have talked in the past to Jason Freed of 37 Signals. He was on uh, Net at Night several times. 37 Signals has become Basecamp. That was their one of their most popular products, still is. And they said, why we forget this 37 Signals? It confuses people. We'll call ourselves Basecamp. And it is the greatest product ever for keeping your teams uh, aligned, organized, productive. And the new Basecamp 3 makes it even better than ever. You know, I'm kind of mad at David. I think when we interviewed him, he was about to release Basecamp 3, but he didn't mention it. He was, he was kind of quiet about the whole thing. 
Many of you uh, listen to know what technologies are going to change how you get your job done. And I got to tell you, Basecamp 3 is the one that you absolutely need. I love the philosophy Jason and David uh, and the whole team at Basecamp bring to this. They feel like you work better. We all work better when we're calmer, more focused. The problem with work these days is, is there's so many distractions that could pull you out of your work. Uh, we don't get the downtime we need. Basecamp is about getting everything done without getting you burned out. And it's got all the tools, of course, you need. Message boards, file storage, to-dos, chats, schedules, automatic check-ins. It's all in there. Uh, what happens, you know, is as projects get bigger, teams get bigger, companies get bigger, something that you could easily manage with just kind of a high across the desk is now way too difficult to keep track of. And that causes stress for everybody. Basecamp is the stress fixer. Because everybody knows what's going on, where everybody stands, who's doing what. You can set up teams to share ideas, to ask questions, collaborate on projects. You can easily bring clients in as well and give them an area they can see and then an area they can't see. Uh, the new home screen is very visual. You see the cards interface? I really like that. Cards show projects, teams. Uh, the company HQ is kind of your, your, your focus uh, on your, it's, it's kind of like an intranet. You can brand your account, of course, with your logo. And the best part about Basecamp, the thing I really like, is it's very affordable and you don't pay per seat licenses. One of the problems with so a lot of the software out there uh, is that you have to make this decision. Well, I want to add somebody to the team and add another $5 a month or whatever. Not with Basecamp. There's no per user fee. You add as many people as you need inside and outside of the company without worrying about the license. It's very affordable and very straightforward. We're actually using it with our live events production team because they have, this is, there's a, there's a stressful job. They, you know, they're thinking right now about CES. They've got to plan it. They've got a lot of threads, you know, not everything from booking hotels to getting camera crews to talking to booths. There's a lot going on. Colleen, who's our executive producer there says she, she loves it. It's very intuitive, provides great visual overview of where everything stands. It's easy to assign tasks to team members, track productivity through reports and daily updates. Kara, who will be going down as one of our uh, crew members, appreciates the email reminders. She says it's easier for me to stay on track. And here's something I like, and I, I bet Kara likes this too. I bet every employee likes this. You set your work schedule, and you can set it so you don't get notifications when you're not working. Yep, it's, it's all about stress-free flow, producing without making yourself nuts. Basecamp will put you back in control of your projects and make your workplace a calmer, more productive, happier workplace. Don't we all need that? You can get it a free right now. Free trial awaits you at Basecamp.com slash twit. Basecamp.com slash twit. I've been you know, a huge fan of these guys and their software for years. I've used Basecamp for years. And I got to say, the new Basecamp 3 is remarkable. Basecamp.com slash twit. Twit. Dan Ackerman is our guest. He's a senior editor at uh, CNET. You, you, do, you cover more than games. You do like laptop reviews and stuff like that. And too. If you come to CNET this week, you can read my review of the new uh, MacBook what Pro with think? the tuck bar. You know, it's it's the MacBook Pro, so it remains sort of the default go-to high-end laptop for creative people. The touch bar, uh, it's kind of cool. I wouldn't go out of my way for it. It basically gives you a bunch of uh, shortcuts that'll save you a couple of keystrokes. And you know what? Long term. That's actually kind of important here. Look, I've got it right here. Oh, I'm so jealous. Look at that. So how long have you used it? Uh, I'm going to say probably about two weeks. Okay, that's uh, enough. And I think what you, yeah, what you end up with is you discover five or six little, like, shortcuts that work for you. Like, instead of hitting, you know, Command L to uh, go to the address bar, you just tap this little button on the on the touch bar. And that it's one click versus two. But I started doing it right away, and I was like, all right, I'm just doing this now. I, uh, you know, really wanted to withhold judgment. I was a little skeptical, but I want to withhold judgment until I've used it for enough time to know whether it's a gimmick or it's actually useful. And then I'm also very worried about the keyboard because I'm not a fan of the of the short travel MacBook keyboard. And it seems I agree with very you completely similar on that. Yeah. Um, I used a 12 inch MacBook for a long time. I actually wrote a huge chunk of this book on the 12 inch MacBook, and that is not the greatest keyboard. Oh, of all you time. are nuts. <laughs> I, I, cause it's just so portable and I would take right. it with me. I, you know, I use a lot of machines, but I use that a lot. So you uh, got used right. to That's it. Not, I, I did, but I never loved it. The version yeah. here I will say is, is, is enough of an improvement that I would give it another shot. 
some people are never going to love it. They're always going to love the big chiclet style keys. And that is it. And I totally get that. And I even agree in large part. Uh, the tweaking they did to the feel of these keys versus the one on the 12 inch MacBook is just different enough that you should give it a shot. All right. Well, my, ours are, uh, I understand ours are on the way right now. We ordered a 13 and a 15 and I'll, um, I, I will give it a shot. I, I, I'm just withholding judgment till I've used it. And I want to use yeah. it for a while. So that's why I asked you how long you'd used it. I mean, the touch I... bar is useful with a lowercase u. You know, they're yeah. waiting for like Photoshop and other apps to like really support it. But you know what? Shortcuts are, uh, we all use keyboard shortcuts instead of mousing to the menu. So this is the next step in that evolution. Uh, but I wouldn't get it just for the touch bar. You're, you're because, a music guy too, right? right? Have you used it for making music at all or using it? I, I have not in this yet but uh you know i've done a lot with like you know using the ipad as like a control surface right. with uh uh, uh you know all, all the music apps and things like that well that's what they showed you know at the announcement they had a dj <laughs> mixing with it oh, you can mix yes. and i thought i don't i think given that or a touch pad a touch device you, why would you choose this little dinky thing yeah yeah the one thing i found it cool for was when you're in photos you can actually rotate your photo just yeah, by yeah. mousing over that and that you know that works fine uh, and flipping through filters works fine. And the transport controls for media, when you're listening to a song or watching a movie or video, you could just scrub back and forth. And, and it's a lot it's a lot easier to do that than using the mouse cursor on the little scrubber bar in the browser right. window. Okay. You can find Dan's full review at CNET.com uh, for this week. The brand, it just, I guess you've had it for a while. The embargo was lifted this week. We're seeing a lot of other reviews. That's right. That, and that I just got, I got the notification this morning that they charged my credit card. So I think that means it's on its way. So we'll have our review, uh, at least a first look uh, this weekend. Give me a couple of weeks to really get a point of view on it. But I'm encouraged. I was, I was really thinking, I'm gonna, if I hate this keyboard, I'm going to be very sad. I think that's why they still sell one of the old models. Right. You can right. still pick up like the old 12 or the old 15 that has the HDMI port and stuff and the regular USB. Back to the Tetris Effect, Dan Ackerman's new book, The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. Uh, I love it that you put it on the shelf there on your website next to Future Shock. Yes. Al <laughs> Alvin Toffler's yes. classic. What are the other ones? Fritz Lieber? See, uh, that's uh, The Wanderer. The um, Wanderer. Uh, is yes. it, this is your bookshelf, clearly. This is my bookshelf. And right below it, I can see there, it's City Primeval by um, 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 Elmore Leonard. It, oh, my. Now, did you choose those on purpose, or is it just random? That's just the kind of books I have. Okay. Because I do feel like Future Shock is appropriate. That is the, that that is good. And and, and Alan Toffler just died a couple months I ago, know, I think. I know. And uh, and really, I mean, that book was in the, came out in the 70s mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, was all about... You know, the future. And I think in many respects, he, he got it right. Tetris, for a lot of us, was uh, kind of a harbinger of our future, addicted to video games, uh, spending a lot of time going like this. And it prepared us for a day when the smartphone was <laughs> the number one screen in our lives, especially when you when you come to the Game Boy. I mean, it really uh, I can, it preconditioned us for what was ahead. We've been training for this for, <laughs> for decades, really. What, what is the iPhone now but an evolution of that hand that was the boy. first handheld screen most people had yeah, you know yeah Do, is tetris still played i mean are we still uh tetris uh addicted oh yeah it's it's huge it's big on uh, there's a facebook version that that's really good the ea version uh, across mobile devices sells tons and tons and tons of copies uh you can get all sorts of versions for the xbox and the playstation and the newest thing that i find super interesting is there's not an official version there's a lot of knockoffs right now for virtual reality and you can see that fits really well in Whoa. with vr so on your Vive and on your uh, Oculus, you can get a ton of games that are Tetris-like, uh, and you're standing there, and the and the things come down, and you move them around with the hand controllers, uh, and that I think is just super interesting. I don't know if I could handle <laughs> handle that. That's is right. It, is it like manipulating big blocks? Some of them are. There's a whole bunch of different versions, and some of them are you're just standing there and the blocks are coming down, and you use the controller to kind of rotate them and shift them and move them down. Uh, there's one for the uh, PlayStation VR where you're sort of the block, and there's these whole you have to fit your body to like fit through the you know the shapes, and they're Tetris-like shapes. What? That would yeah, you be. Have to, yeah, you have to import the shape and then fit yourself you know through the hole. Yeah. <laughs> I want to play that one. That's the one I'm going to play. So uh, let's go back now to the Cold War. So the the big court battle now is uh, is is assembled. All the players they, did they get Alexei to come to the U.S. Was he able to get out? 
Fortunately, Alexei uh, was able to get out. Nikolai Belikov was able to get out. This ended up being the culmination of many different court battles between Tengen, which was a division of Atari, and Nintendo. And they were like mortal enemies, like the snake and the mongoose. Uh, they were fighting over so many things, largely because... Uh, Tengen reverse engineered the secret chips in Nintendo cartridges where you had to have the official Nintendo that. chip, a lockout yes. chip. So, yes. so Tengen, which was run by a friend of the guys at Nintendo, they thought they were friends. And then he comes in and goes, oh, I reverse engineered your chip. I'm not going to pay you know, you licensing fees to put out Nintendo games anymore. And by the way, I'm also putting out my own version of Tetris. Uh, so interlocking court cases, they eventually end up uh, – uh, in court. And the big argument is, is that original uh, deal that that guy Robert Stein signed with the Russians way back when and all the other deals sprung from it, is that is that legitimate? And what does it cover? Uh, the sneaky part is the Russians actually, they seem pretty clueless during this entire thing. They don't understand technology. They don't understand business. They don't understand IP licensing. They had a V-Lord. They paid him in cash because he didn't have a, you know, a bank account. <laughs> Like that, that, that's how old school these guys are. You know it's what? Like a briefcase got... full of cash. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, I, I'll tell you, they outsmarted everybody. Wow. They, 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 they snuck in a contract revision during one of these Moscow trips with this guy, Robert Stein, uh, that backdated the definition of what a computer is uh, in the contract. Uh, to to define it as a computer as being something with a, a monitor and a base system and an operating system and a keyboard, like a very specific uh, uh, definition. So when Tengen, the, basically the, the inheritor of this contract, went to court and they said, well, th this covers, you know, anything. Consoles are like computers. In, in Japan, they call it the family computer, the Famicom. So Famicom. our argument is good right. for this. Right. And the Russians said, oh, no, we only meant uh, real computers. The other deal were given to the guys who then licensed it to Hank Rogers and Nintendo. Uh, and because they snuck this poison pill uh, uh, contract revision in, the judge said, yeah, you know, that that's what a computer is. And a <sighs> Famicom, even though they call it a computer, there's no keyboard, there's no real disk operate, disk based operating system, there's no separate monitor. Uh, they they basically Nintendo Nintendo won, and uh, Tangan had to take their warehouse of like hundreds of thousands of Tetris cartridges wow. that were already selling phenomenally and lock them up, and no one knows what happened to them. They just disappeared into into the mists of time, like all those ET games that vanished. Well, they would have lost in the long run because, of course, they're uh, they're counterfeit CIC chip ended up losing in court too. Yes. Yeah, that was part of that long battle between those two companies. This was just one this was a big skirmish though because they lost millions and millions of dollars in inventory uh, with right. those Tetris games that they had banked on. They took out full page newspaper ads. They had a launch party in New York at the Russian Tea Room. Like they really, this was going to be the big game that broke Tengen and they had to take it off the market after two months and they never, Yikes. they never recovered. Yeah. Yeah, wow. The ironic part it was the better version. It was better. Oh, really? Than, and everyone said you played it. It's better. And you can get emulators. You can play it. Uh, people sell them on eBay for like a hundred bucks. Okay, so the guy you can't who get it. That was okay. a guy named Ed Log who famously programmed like Asteroids and a bunch of other uh, early '80s games. And he was just a genius. And he made this great version of Nintendo Tetris. But the version that Nintendo put out, uh, based on Hank Rogers' version. It's frankly, not as good. <laughs> now, There's I don't read Anik in the books very, very quickly. The read Anik in the book yes, where please. Alexei Pajanov plays Hank Rogers' version of Tetris. Hank Rogers takes him to his hotel room in Moscow. He brings out like a portable TV he brought with him from Japan because of the you know the signal issues and a, and a Famicom. He goes, "Here's my version of Tetris I made. I hope you love it." And Alexei Pajanov plays it and he doesn't like it. He's like, "This just feels all wrong. I don't understand." Well, I guess they're making the game. That's good, but man, I would have done a better job. Wow, what was wrong with it? You know, the timing, I think, was a little bit off, and the fact that they translated it to the Nintendo controller, which is sort of very left-hand oriented with the D-pad here and the buttons. Right. Uh, uh, and, and, and Alexi built it to work with the arrow keys on the keyboard and, like, the space bar, and it was a very right-handed thing. Uh, but just the just just the, the the level of acceleration just felt off. They didn't have the programming down to mimic sort of the gravitational pull of the pieces. You wouldn't think it'd be that hard. It probably isn't that hard, but it takes a sensitivity to what makes that game exciting and good that may not it's be all immediately about the feel, obvious. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. It's all about the feel. Come to think of it, the gravity and the and the and the movement. And and the thing is, it's when you play it, it becomes so in, in internalized that if something's even just millisecond off. That's enough. It's like a stair step that's an inch too high. It just, it just doesn't feel. You right. just stumble over it, and that's yeah. what a lot of the, the the versions of Tetris that didn't break through had right. that problem. A lot of the knockoff versions. That's why that Tengen one uh, was considered like one of the greatest versions ever. Now I'm gonna have to try it.
And those cartridges somehow have survived because people are selling them? People, people, people hoarded them. People went to Blockbuster and, and rented them <laughs> and then said, oh, I lost it. I don't know. It's gone. Uh, I don't know what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, it is not on the uh, NES Classic. They did not put I Tetris on I know. I was very there. disappointed about that. I wonder why but, uh, not. There's a lot of licensing with it. Yeah. Uh, the Tetris company. Well, the nice, the nice code to the story is, and you very rarely hear this about creator stories, is that after the Cold War, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Hank Rogers helped Alexei Pajidov reassert uh, at least part of the control over the Tetris rights. And then Alexei moved to the U.S. and the two of them formed a partnership, and they They're now are together. partners in. In the Tetris Company, all yeah. these years later, that's yeah. run out of Hawaii, where Hank lives. Isn't that great? That is a nice story. It really is nice because yeah. they're because they're nice guys and everybody loves these guys and yeah. it's great that you know they they came out on top they beat the Soviet Union and all these big Western companies. So um, uh, eventually, the, what what was the right situation after this this big court battle? Did Spectrum Holobyte and uh, Miracast had the rights to PC versions only? Correct. And Nintendo had the right to the console versions only. That right. right? Uh, Hank Rogers got the rights to the handheld version, which he then flipped to Nintendo, which was the plan all along. Okay. Nintendo sent him to Russia to do that. And then the Russians said, do you want to, because we because we say this old contract is only good for PCs, do, do your friends at Nintendo want to make a play for all the console rights? And they said, yeah. So that started this whole big you know, series of negotiations, and I think they gave the Russians like $5 million or something like that. That's all? Those, right? Well, this is like the early, you know, that, that that's almost like the down payment. That's like the advance. And they and with Roy, so they had a royalty structure. Right, yeah. Yeah. Cuz I mean there was a movie there. This thing ended up in the Museum of Modern Art is I mean, yeah, yeah. how many copies of, of of Tetris were sold? It's got to be oh, hundreds hundred, of millions. Yeah. Hundreds yeah. of millions. Yeah. Like EA alone has done 500 million downloads on the on the iPhone version. How did EA get the rights to it? Uh, the Tetris company is very good at licensing that game out to okay. partners they think are going to do a good job with it. And EA has been doing mobile games for a long time. They've been very successful, uh, especially in the phone game space. And, uh, you know, they've done a good job at this. You could play it on your smartwatch now. That's, That's crazy. The right there. That's, it. That's crazy. Tetris will never die. I don't think so. It's one of the few games that it really holds up all these years later because it doesn't feel all that retro. All you have to do is dress up the graphics that tiny yeah. bit and it feels as modern as Candy Crush or Bejeweled or anything else yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's got this timeless quality because it's not dependent on the technology whereas you go back and play the original Legend of Zelda or Mario or Pac-Man. They're games of their time. They're great games, classic games, but they are of their era where Tetris is timeless partially because it's based on that pentomino puzzle that goes back you know, 100 years before that. How much money did Alexei end up making on it? Did he did he do okay? Originally, originally nothing. But once he got his share of the rights back, and he partnered with Hank, and they formed the Tetris Company, uh, he's done very well. And Hank has done very well, and okay. they're all very happy with how things have gone. Good. And he got out of the Soviet Union. It was if after it fell, it was not the Soviet Union. He was able to leave. Is that right? He got out in the early '90s uh, with Hank's oh. help again, and he actually came to the U.S. And for many years, he worked for the only other organization in the world besides the Soviet Union that you would call the evil empire, and that is Microsoft. <laughs> what did he do at Microsoft? He made a game called Hexic that was oh. on like every original like Xbox 360, and he worked on a whole bunch of other stuff with them. But it just shows you, uh, and it, we see it so many times in so many uh, spheres. You know, they sometimes say, you, you know, everybody has one good book in them. There, <laughs> it's very hard when you make a game that's as good as Tetris to do a follow up, and uh, and really none of the games like say did later had uh, had any of the were near the clout that Tetris did. It it, it, it might, part of the problem might have been that some of the other games were like Hattress, where you're stacking hats, and Facetress, where you're stacking faces. <laughs> okay. <I'm just> <laughs> A little derivative. <laughs> Gotta go back to the well. <laughs> yeah, well, I sh I'm not one to complain. I only had one idea for a show ever, and I just keep doing it over and over again. But this is my idea of a great show. Dan Ackerman is our guest, senior editor at CNET. His new book is all about Tetris. It's the story of the Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world. And as we mentioned, it's out on Audible as well as in hardcover and uh, on Kindle as well. You can get it. You can get it everywhere. And you know, we've uh, there is a this is a genre now uh, that is huge um, of of 
reliving these games, not by playing them or buying them, but by actually reading about them. And it's so funny to know the backstory of something that you kind of lived so intimately for so long. It's a f and this backstory, boy, there, this is there's none better. This is fascinating. We'll have some more with Dan in just a moment. Our show today brought to you by Curiosity Stream. You watch this show because, and all our shows because you're interested in life. You want to know more. Uh, and Curiosity Stream is pretty much made for us. It's the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. Do you know who it was put together by John Hendricks, who did the founded the Discovery Channel? So he understands kind of what's going on out there. He's put together a library, and it's growing all the time. Currently 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content. And, boy, I love this because I just got a 4K TV. 50-plus hours of 4K content. So if you've got a new TV and you're looking for a way to see it in all its glory, you got to check out. And i got a great deal for you, Curiosity Stream. By the way, unlike a lot of these channels, it's available basically worldwide, 196 countries. Web app, of course, but also there's a Roku app, which means you can play it on that new 4K Roku. There's an Android app, iOS, Chromecast. I can play it on my uh, NVIDIA Shield and my Chromecast. Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, Apple TV. Uh, and it's a, it's a lot of stuff that you're interested in. Technology, space, history. Look at that. John, Jason Silva's Road to the Singularity, the Chaos Theory. Uh, Stephen Hawking's favorite place is one of my favorites. It's a brand new documentary, and it's exclusive, too, in which Hawking, is he's like flying this spaceship around the universe and stopping at like places he really likes. It's so cool. You, gotta, it's, you just got to see this. Digits, brand new, three-part series hosted by Derek Muller, creator of uh, the YouTube Science Channel. I know you've seen it, uh, Veritasium. I love it. He talks about online safety and security and has interviews with Edward Snowden and Vince Cerf. Uh, Deep Time History, an exclusive three-part documentary series telling the story of the universe's history. Actually, I, I, I played this one for Michael because he was asking, when is the sun going to explode and how long have we been around? 14 billion years with some great stuff. Anyway, Underwater Wonders, if you like that of the National Parks to celebrate the uh, centennial of the National Park Service. Monthly and annual plans are available, but they, they're, it's very affordable. $2.99 a month, less than the cup of, a cup of coffee or one title on those other platforms, gives you full access to everything. And if you go to curiositystream.com slash twit and use the promo code twit at checkout, you're going to get a very special deal. It's normally 30 days for a free trial. And when you use the offer code TWIT, it doubles to 60 days free, two entire months of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries anywhere. Curiositystream.com slash TWIT. Please do try it. Uh, then use the offer code TWIT at sign up. They say there's no good 4K content. Oh no, my friend, there is a lot. And it's all at curiositystream.com slash TWIT. Dan Ackerman is our guest from CNET. He's a senior editor there, covers laptops and uh, also, been covering gaming for a long time. You come to this honestly. You know, every time I talk about this stuff, people go, you're not a gamer. I play games. I don't know what a gamer means. You know, I don't I don't live in Call of Duty, but uh, but games like this, ca they call them casual games. I've been playing, uh, I've been playing since before you were born, kid. And one of them is That's Tetris. Right. <laughs> Since 1984, 85. The Tetris Effect, the game that hypnotized the world, and really was kind of a backstory to the fall of the Iron Curtain. Alexei Pichitnov's amazing story and all of the people who were, you know, fighting for the rights. Actually, it was until I read your book, I thought, I really thought that it didn't go well for Alexei and that he kind of lost out and uh, and that, you know, it ended up being practically public domain. But I'm, I, I was completely wrong, and I understand that now. Um, this is this is a, kind of has a happy ending, doesn't it? It does, and that's so rare to see in these sort of creator-driven stories, especially ones that have such a tumultuous history. And that's sort of that's what drew me to this in the first place. It's a game story, and that's interesting, I guess. We've all played Tetris, uh, but when I looked at it, I realized 
it was a startup story and where he upsets mm-hmm. about startups now and creators and their rights. And it was a Cold War sort of political business thriller story. And we're very interested in sort of, you know, the politics of business today. Uh, and it made it seem super relevant. Uh, and then when I got to meet, uh, basically when I got to talk to Hank and Alexi and a lot of these other characters, they were so interesting and had such great stories. And I think the key to good nonfiction is really good stories. So yes. there's so many great anecdotes and, and bits about uh, the Russian space program and spies and things like that, that uh, <laughs> I, I just I just said, I have to write this book now because it's, you couldn't write this as a movie if you tried. Tetris is so ubiquitous. Works is right, reminding me in the chat room. You can actually play it in Emacs. Meta X Tetris. And you can play <laughs> It's built into Emacs. Probably not a licensed copy. But uh, it's even written in Elisp, so there, there you go. And I suppose that many of us just never uh, would, would uh, you know, get a new phone without installing Tetris first. Do you still play? Uh, you know, I have that Tetris Blitz version on my phone. I flip around in that a little bit. I feel like I've, I've had my film Tetris for a little while. Are you sick of it? Yeah, that uh, sometimes happens too, right? You just go, ah. But now the VR thing has got me super interested again. So I'm trying all these geospatial games with big blocks falling down and arranging them in virtual reality. And I feel like that's where the most interesting things in game development are happening right now. It's almost hard to play a 2D game and be interested in it. I'm very excited about the possibilities of this, of this 360 world that we're building right, for ourselves. right. So uh, in your process, you found out a lot about Tetris that you, you didn't know. And I was reading the book, I didn't know. Tell us a few of the things that surprised you as you discovered them. My, my, my favorite stories uh, in this book really involve Howard Lincoln, who was like the chief counsel for Nintendo uh, back then, later became their chairman, and then later spent like 15 or 20 years as the president of the Seattle Mariners. I think he just retired this year. Uh, famously combative uh, uh, lawyer type, uh, basically saved Nintendo's bacon more than a few times. Uh, so he's in Moscow uh, doing some negotiating with the Russians over like, you know, how much are they going to give them? Is it for this or for that? Uh, and, and the Russians smell money. And they're they're like, oh, where can we get some more money here? <laughs> He's sitting in the room. They bring in a cosmonaut. And they go, this is comrade so-and-so. He's been up in space. Uh, he would like to talk to you about the Russian wow. space program. And the cosmonaut says, oh, we, we think maybe Nintendo could sponsor the space program. We'd spend the, send the Soyuz capsule up and we'd say Nintendo on the side. What do you think of that? Uh, and and, and, and he's, he's like, I don't know if that's really a great idea. But then they drag him to the secret space training facility, uh, the secret city that they built, like Star City One. I forget exactly what it's called. On the, you know miles outside of Moscow, where they train the astronauts on like the fake you know equipment that they built, and no one's allowed there. But they send they send Howard Lincoln there. Uh, with his son, and, and they go, oh, yeah, come visit. Uh, this is top secret stuff. Want to take some pictures? Yeah, take pictures. It's no problem. Uh, all this to try to convince them to, like, you know, get Nintendo to be a, a, a sponsor of the space program, which, which never happened but would have been awesome. Tetris, uh, the name, this was something I didn't know, is related to tennis? Yeah, yeah, you break it down. The you know, pentominoes is five pieces, so tetra is four, four. Uh, and it also relates to uh, so tetrominoes uh, plus. Yeah, plus like the Greek word for like uh, that translates into tennis. It's like a, it's, it's, there's no Russian in it at all. It, it's it's purely like a Latin so Greek it origin. Have, it, tetra. It doesn't have a different name in Russia. That's this. That's the name worldwide. That's the universal name. Yeah, yeah. and everyone and and Alexei Pajanov's friend said, Man, I don't get this name. He's like, that's the name. I picked it, and that's what it's saying. It describes what it is. Actually, it was a good it. name. That, yeah, that, it was. Snap. It is a good name. It global, it's hard to pick a name that's globally successful, and I think that Tetris is one of them. I also didn't know it was written in in Turbo Pascal, which kind of warmed my heart a little bit because that was a programming language that revolutionized uh, uh, computer programming in those days, uh, made it accessible to a lot of people because it was cheap. And that's what the Russians had to work with back then. They right. had that, and they had punch card machines. Right. Uh, and eventually, <laughs> things got a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> the book. But it was the, actually. Go ahead. It was great going back and talking to some of these guys about these I '80s bet. computers that I used to own. Like right. King Rogers and I nerded out over the uh, uh, Tandy TRS-80, the Trash right. 80 that we both had, right. uh, with with the cassette drive. Yep. Uh, and so you'd walk it, across it, it, the floor and touch it and bzz, it would zap it and, oh. <laughs> and the oh, yeah. whole thing would crash and <laughs> you'd sit there and wait like 12 to 15 minutes for like a program to load up because it was playing on an audio cassette uh yeah we yeah we had a great time going back over all this old computer history which is a ton of fun i love to that. show you how old i actually am that was my first computer a trs80 okay. uh, color computer that's pretty good all right i'll, I'll uh, coco guy I'll that's give, right coco. i'll give you that the tetris effect the game that hypnotized the world uh, from Hachette uh, Audio on uh, on Audible.com, Hachette uh, in, in hardcover. 
Uh, it's available everywhere. It's a must read because even if you never played the game, it really is. A, it, it's how, so interesting how a game can weave itself through the history of the 80s and the 90s uh, so effectively. And if you played the game, well, then you absolutely have to read it. And right now I'm going to go home and install Tetris Bliss on my, uh, on my iPhone and start playing. Great to talk to you, Dan. Thanks for joining oh, it's so us. So great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Dan Ackerman, senior editor at CNET. Read his new review of the Apple MacBooks, MacBook Pros, and all his other uh, work on uh, CNET at CNET.com. Thanks, Dan. We do triangulation every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to tune in live, we appreciate it because your thoughts and the questions and uh, stuff you talk about in the chat room really helps me do a better job uh, on the show. But if you can't be here live during the show, don't worry. Every show we do is available on demand after the fact at uh, our website, in this case, twit.tv slash TRI. And if you can't make it uh, there, you can subscribe in your favorite podcasting application i use pocket cast but there's stitcher there's slacker there's we're on google we're on amazon echo all you have to do is uh, ask for the podcast from tune in on amazon echo and you can play it really there's a lot of ways to get it in fact there's no excuse <laughs> if, you, if you're not listening to triangulation you're missing out on some of the best conversations uh on the uh, on the internet thanks for joining us we'll see you next time oh don't forget we only have a few more days left to get for some reason this is not a bestseller for us the ugly twit Christmas sweatshirt. It's the uh, Merry Twitmas at teespring.com. Now, is that the site? Teespring.com slash twitmas. There it is. Click that one. There you go. And it is truly ugly. It says Merry Twitmas on it. Not a sweater. We couldn't get, we couldn't get enough knitters together in time. So uh, we have the uh, sweatshirt. We have a we, we have a, a tank top. Okay, that's really bad. We have a t-shirt, men's and women's, many sizes. Eight days left as uh, as we record this. We've only sold fifty six of them, and uh, I think that that shows that uh, Twit listeners have excellent taste. Excellent taste, Mary. Tw <laughs> but in case you feel the need, this would be a great gift for somebody you don't like. Uh, <laughs> it's not like we make a lot of money on it. It's just fun, and I thought it would be a fun thing to do, and boy, was I wrong. Teespring, T-E-E-S-P-R-I-N-G dot -E com slash twitmas. You have eight days left to get yours. They will certainly be a collector's item. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Triangulation. Triangulation.